First, welcome everyone. And before everybody starts, all the pictures of this session are from a guy called J.D. Hancock. And he's a guy that has a lot of action figures about everything. And yeah, I like it a lot. So I'm gonna mention him again in the end. But what I'm gonna talk here is about deploying machine learning and yeah, try to take out a little bit of the hype around machine learning AI and try to make sure that people a little bit understand and try to include this on their DevOps initiatives. And when I talk DevOps initiatives, please, it's not Ansible or Kubernetes. It's the overall company initiative, for example, that Michael and uh, Bridget talked yesterday. Yeah, my Michael, I mean uh, Ducey. So. so to start, if this works. No, it doesn't. Okay. Because this is something that I really, really like it a lot when I saw a month ago. When people talk about DevOps, they start to create these silos and these teams, and there was this tweet in May, and I really, really enjoyed it because if you're going to this direction of having DevOps teams, we're gonna have to create Dev DevOps or DevOps Ops, and then we go into this e eternal loop because DevOps arise from this timeless uh, conflict that you can see on the DevOps handbook, people telling about the downwards spiral that is just like IT ops wants to look for the stability development, wants to build new features, then you start to get stuck into things and you get to a point that you don't deliver what you expect from it, then the sales team has to overpromise what you're doing and then you have to start to cutting, cutting around the corners for both sides, generating technical depth and then going into this eternal downward spiral, always adding more things, people are unhappier, people are getting dizzy with the amount of things, you're always cutting corners, you can never do this new stuff and you start to get frustrated and you just quit the company and go someplace else, because now you're gonna do it right. <laughs> so this is usually how DevOps started and this initiative, so it's much more a uh, culmination of philosophical movements, management movements, and lean and things than just Ansible and Kubernetes and all these things. So just want to highlight this because what I do is related to deploying machine learning into production within companies and try to make sure that when a data science, on that case, I was a data science back in the days, we can develop a model and with short time to market, we can deploy that into production without having to deliver a notebook to someone, a Jupyter notebook, and wait three months to see that Python model running in production. Because, yeah, we know, DevOps saved the world. DevOps is here, is all the hype as well, but it's an amazing thing if we do it right. But the other good part of DevOps is that there is no manifesto, there is no set of initiatives, there is no right standard, there is no end to the journey. It's an uncontinuous progress of trying to make things better. Because DevOps did this. It made sure that the product and the business side, together with the developers, get into better contact with IT ops, QA, InfoSec, and try to add this into the loop. Uh, I'm not going to go into the DevSecOps, DevBizOps, and DevML Ops, or AI Ops, or whatever, because we are now on this other hype. That's the part that I work with that is AI. And you hear this a lot. After the last Google conference, you hear that, whoa. They make phone calls? Come on, you are an AI specialist, come to my company, let's build something with TensorFlow and get more funding. That's what we need to do with AI. And then you start to get into that uh, increasing feel that, wait, can you also do that in containers using blockchain? <laughs> and then people like start to say, okay, now this person is VP of product. That first person, no. Now this person. But then someone else joins the meeting and says, wait, 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 wait. Why we not create an AI DevOps cloud native application on Kubernetes using blockchain that the user will experience with a VR headset and this will be our digital transformation disruptive strategy. And this person is not just VP of product anymore, this person is the new CEO. They get the funding, he goes to San Francisco, he moves to the Bay Area, he gets a lot of money on it and he starts working on it. But the thing is, the majority of the companies are not greenfields. We are working with brownfields because to do machine learning you need data. And to need data you need to have something before. So the majority, I never worked in a full startup that didn't have any data beforehand. 
they are usually AI startups that start as a branch of a bigger company that already has data and want to solve something. So it's not completely a green field. They already have some cultures, they already have some initiatives, they already do sometimes CI CD pipelines, they already have some DevOps initiatives on, on how they're doing, and they are always trying to improve the culture. But to try to get a little bit more to stop saying AI and ML, I'm gonna use my own definition of AI ML just to make sure that we are on the same track. AI for me is just making computers capable of doing things that when, when done by a human, would thought to require intelligence. So when I talk about AI here, think about this now. You can disagree with me, but this is what I mean. Just want to avoid the misconfusion around it. And what the hell do you mean about machine learning? What the hell do you mean about ML? ML for me is a part of the AI ecosystems where you make machines find patterns without explicitly programming them to do so. What I mean about that is that if you want to do a, is a hot dog or not a hot dog thing, on your phone, what you are gonna do is you are going to f use an algorithm, a statistical learning algorithm, anything that you can want can be from deep learning to not, to feed some data and try to fetch, okay, this image has a hot dog or not. You cannot use a regular software program and say like, if pixel one has R255 and green 236 and this and make all the if and else clauses to say this has a hot dog or doesn't have a hot dog. You have to have an error on it, you have to use machine learning. But these bring something different into the loop because how do you test this? How to put this in your pipeline? How do you deploy it? The persons that are building this, usually data science, and now we have this machine learning engineer that is trying to bring software engineering into the data science, they are not completely familiar with your pipeline and how you're bringing things to production. So now, what we had before now we have, we have to add these two people on the loop. And it's very, very clear because as Ducey said yesterday, and everybody talk, when they talk about DevOps, DevOps is a company-wide initiative. It's not putting dev and opsing something or declaring DevOps CC or whatever. No, you have to put all these people together so you have to bring the data science and the machine learning engineers into the loop. Because the majority of you here are software engineers, ops engineers, and people, and I know you do your best to improve. We are here. Uh, I was talking to Chris yesterday, and like we are in a little bit of a bubble here. The people that come to this conference, they are the people that are working on Kubernetes open source. They are people that are trying the new stuff, but the real world on premises, on banks, on, on airlines, and, and all these things, they are, they, they are not able yet due to several restrictions, but the majority of it is cultural restrictions to do what we can do. But I know you're doing your best to improve your workday. You are using Ansible, you are treating infrastructure as a code, you have your CI/CD pipeline, you try to test, you try to make things scalable, resilient, and everything that you do. But while you're doing this, and increasing the flow, putting the feedback, continuous learning, the three ways, reading the Phoenix project, reading the goal, beyond the goal, learning all of this. While you're doing this, a data science is building a model in your company probably now. And this data science usually has no connection directly to the IT department. Sometimes he's in finance, sometimes he's in marketing, sometimes he's even in HR, and he gets a set of data and starts to work. How do the data science usually work is that they have local developments usually. Few data science for the last years are starting to work on Docker, but still on a local machine, Docker. They are working on R, they're working in Python, they're doing their own things, but they're still doing local development. And besides that, they do something different, that is, they usually work with CSVs on a laptop. And by CSVs on a laptop, I mean, you ask him, for example, to solve a problem in a company. Let's say is a, airline, and the airline company wants to make sure that he's not, she is not making too much food that goes into the airplanes. So you have to fetch information from several different systems. Some of the systems are event-driven, some of the systems are not, but the data science doesn't know how this works, so he goes to a data warehousing. He f does a SQL query, fetch some information from there, loads this, that CSV into his, onto his computer, 
starts working from there on his local development. This is usually how things start. But the problem is that model building takes time. Because they fetch the CSV, they start working on their things, and they realize that after one week, they have a model that is 38, 50, 52% accurate. And they come from an, an, an environment where lots of them are PhD or work in academia that they don't want to show information to people that are not good enough for them. So they just keep iterating and improving, water falling into the problem without sharing. And this model building takes time. They spend one week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, three months. They reach something that they think is good, it's 90% accurate, they go and show it to the CEO, to the manager, whoever they want. They go there, they show this to them and say like, hey, this is a PPT presentation with my results, this is a confusion matrix, this is the graph, this is the accuracy, we have everything there. Our model is perfect, right? Now for the drama part. He goes and shows this to the CEO. The CEO looks at him and says, hey, Bridget, you are the data science. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bridget, you win an, an award because you, are, because you are the famous data science that built this. And now, you are the AV specialist for the rest of it, right? <laughs> and let's pretend you are the ops guy, and then someone comes to you. It's not gonna hurt, I promise you. <laughs> he comes to you and say, hey, deploy this. <laughs> okay? <laughs> the IT ops receives this because the AI company starts by this. Someone builds a machine learning model, people mistake machine learning with AI, the CEO comes and say, we are an AI company now, they come to the operations team and say, now deploy this. And you look at it, it's a gigantic Jupyter notebook that you have no clue how you can deploy that. <laughs> because when you look at that, it feels like markdown in a lot of stuff, running some Python on a local development, reading from a CSV, and you are, I don't know, you have a LAMP stack. How the hell do you deploy that into production? Well, well, if we're on a, on a LAMP stack, I think we have more problems, but let's just start with this one. Then we have the continuation of the timeless conflict, the return of AI. So instead of dev fighting with ops, now we have machine learning specialists, data science, fighting with IT, saying that my job is done, I built my model, it's up to you now to put into production. And screw you. So the dev people have to figure out exactly how to put that code in a deployable state, and the IT operations team have to find how to make that model something that you can monitor, operate, track, API endpoints. I'm gonna serve that as a, a regular API, I'm gonna serve that as a gRPC, is this a function that is calling something? How are things working? You have no clue. You were, not, you were never, never part of building that process. It was a PhD guy that did this in three months. But the CEO already made an announcement that you are an AI company. So this is usually what I go to companies and try to help. Because these are some problems that I have seen. Some I may even have caused when I was a data science. Because what usually happens is you are asked to do things that you are not good and hired for. And by that I mean, after you show that thing to the CEO, you want to help. You as a data science, you want to help the IT team to deploy this. So you start to become the data engineering bro. So you start to build your pipeline. You have no clue how to do unit tests, how to do integration tests, how to build things, but you are doing software engineering. And on the other hand, a software engineer needs to improve your machine learning algorithm for the data science, and he has no clue what is a convolutional neural network, what is a hyperparameter, how he tweaked that, and the operations team has no clue how to serve this model. So you start to have all again this downward spiral that you have to go for the deadline, you have to do everything that you need to do, but you have no clue what you need to do for. And you start to realize that feature engineering won't scale. And by that I mean, you remember that I told that data science usually fetch something from a data warehousing? 
but they do a lot of things on your local computer. They pick it up a uh, categorical variable and try to put this as numerical variables. They try to do a lot of feature engineering locally. They end up with another CSV that they use to build that model. But when you try to put that on a production system, you realize that all that feature engineering process, all that building your golden data set to train the model in the production, it won't be done in one minute, five minutes, one hour. It demands a batch of stuff that goes into several different events and this won't scale well. And you realize another thing. You were working on a data warehousing generating CSVs from SQL queries, but then the CEO demands that this model be deployed in an event-driven system. Now, instead of doing batch things, I want you to hook to the Kafka queues, subscribe to some topics, and build something on real time. But wait, I didn't build it for that. So you start to have to rebuild the entire model to do things because nobody had a clue what you were doing before. Why? You were a PhD working alone beforehand. And then, after you overcome all of these problems, you manage to deploy a thing into a production, you start to see that model drifts. When, when I talk about model drifts, it's very, very counterintuitive to some people that don't work to machine learning, like, wait, the machine is learning, but it's learning worst? How, how can I train a model now that is 9% accuracy, and within time it gets 85% accuracy? Well, let me tell you something. Machine learning is learning. And if you don't tweak the model, if you don't adjust, it will lose effectiveness within time. Mainly because when you deploy something, let's give you an example for, let's say you build a recommendation system for a, a website. When people start to use that and interact with that model, you affect your data set. You're gonna change the way that people behave and interact with the original features of the data and you have to retweak your model, recalibrate it, otherwise it will drift and become worse and worse and worse. So the role of the data science and the machine learning engineer does not end when the first batch of model is done. No, he needs to operate, he needs to do things, he needs to recalibrate, he needs to be part of the team that takes care of that feature. That sounds familiar for a lot of us. And when I talk about model fragility as well, it's a little bit different. That means a lot of communication, for example, Let's say one of my features is a data field that is on a MySQL database. It's an old MySQL database, people are using this, it's the core platform, and some data architect or some software engineer decided that they need to change some fields. Instead of getting value with VAT, now you want value without VAT to be saved in your database. So they just changed it. So, and you don't know. So you start to receive different things in your feature engineering. How well can your model handle these changes, how fragile he can be when these things change in production? Or let's go even worse. You use GDP per capita as part of your model. That's not built by your company, it's an external data. And Trump decides that the US is not gonna calculate GDP as everyone else. He has this new way of calculating GDP. How will that affect your model? How dependent you are on that feature? how fragile your model is. You need to take that into account. And to do that, how you catch these things, you need to monitor, you need to operate, you need to be part of the team. And this also has a lot to do with onboarding new people, changing stuff. Someone build a data science model, a machine learning algorithm, or whatever, and that person, like I said, they usually commit two or three times to a source repository just when they think the model is good enough. So they work three months in a model and you have two commits on GitHub. And then that person leaves the company, someone else comes and looks at that and it's like, oh, that person didn't try this algorithm. But actually he did, but he never saved that to the source repository. So we have a lot of rework and unplanned and invisible work that these people has to do because nobody is aware of what was happening before. And this is very, very harmful for you. It's really, really one of the biggest wastes that I see in departments, that I see people saying like, I'm doing this, I'm trying these parameters, trying this algorithm, and then after two weeks, someone else comes, oh, but I remember someone already did that before on the same data set. But you don't have the results, you don't know how it did, you don't know how it happened. If, 
If that feels familiar to you, yeah, it happens. And also, when we talk about machine learning and serving machine learning models, we notice one thing, it's really, really hard to measure. Because the holy grail of machine learning and AI models is that the hot dog or not a hot dog example, you may recommend this is a hot dog or not, but you never know if that is actually a hot dog. It's serving on the cell phone of the person. You don't get the feedback if, if your model was correct or not. You can do some QA, have some samples and try to do things, but you don't know exactly what to measure. So you can try to look at the funnel and try to do different things. Like I see that after deploying this machine learning feature or this endpoint or thing like this, I'm seeing that my funnel has changed. I see that people are spending more time on my website. I see that people are doing more of this. I see more of that. But you will never, never, never know that your, your machine learning endpoint was the result of that. You have to proxy things. And this is really, really hard. And then you have to go to James uh, Turnbull and the art of uh, monitoring and try to figure out what is the added business value of that feature and how you can measure that based on the business. Because that is what matters. You are not building machine learning algorithms in production into companies because you want to do research. I'm sorry, if you are working for the company, majority of us, we are of course because we like it, because it's fun, it's because it's happy, but the company needs to make money. So your model needs to help that happen. But I know that this has a lot to do with culture change. And that's why I think this is important here because the culture change that I mean is involve machine learning and data science into the entire pipeline. And also teach them that if they build a model that is 50% accuracy, you are not gonna deploy that into production. That's cool. But it needs to be on a deployable state from day one. And they need to share that they have tried this algorithm with this data set, with these parameters, so you can build on top of that so you don't have to rework that on the future. And how I usually do this is very, very tricky for analytics and data science, and that is continuous delivery for it. How do you see that this is not the drone that you're looking for in the middle of your pipeline? How can you look at things and make sure that the data science and the machine learning engineer is actually building something that is tested, integrated, stress tested, and things like this? How can you do that? How can you put that in, on the pipeline? Yeah, it's applying regular, regular software engineering skills to machine learning and data science. So you have to build more multidisciplinary teams and stop with the data science team separated from IT or for ops or for whatever they wanna call, because they should be a part of the team. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a demo, I hope the gods are kind, about how I do this usually into companies. Uh, let's say, Let's say that a data science decides to build a very, 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 very simple model. This is a linear model using some data from wine. No, I'm not an alcoholic. And what they do is they fetch, there is a data set that I pick it up that has some uh, numerical qualities about wine, like acidity, percentage of this, percent of that, and I want to predict on a scale from one to 10 how good this wine is. So I need to have a label data set with the quality of the wine and all these things so I can train this model. The data science build this Python thing. It's not big, it's only 70 lines. But there is one thing from Databricks that was released three weeks ago that is quite nice called MLflow. And what I'm showing this here is because this, just like the monitoring thing and this thing, doesn't add tension to the data science workflow. They, it's a pip package that they can install in their Python that will just add a lot of functionalities to them. For example, I build this model. Let's go and run this model. Uh, let's activate my... So I'm in a virtual environment, everything's there, everything's cool, I'm gonna run this model. I decided on this model that I, was, that I was going to measure some things to see if my model is good or not. I can define this on the functions. On the functions here, like 
define evaluation metrics, and I define here what are the functions that I want to compare to. I run this model, I got all this stuff, but realize that when I did this, this folder up here, ML runs. This ML runs has a UUID showing exactly when I run that with a specific time and things like this. And here, there is already the metrics that I, that, I, that I got from the model, the parameters that I input to the model, and the deployable artifacts. And I get all of this just by using this pip package. And I'm sharing this because I built similar stuff into companies, but they are never open source. But Databricks built this and decided to open source two weeks ago, so it's quite nice. It's still very, very alpha, but it's very, very nice. And now I can do this, MLflow UI. So now I can show to you a React application that is showing my last run, who did that, which algorithm he, he, he ran, which, which file, what was the git commit that he did, what was the parameters, what were the metrics. I can come here, I can see that I have the artifacts here, I have everything. So you can imagine that if you build this point into an S3 bucket or something like that, all your data science can put all their runs into the same place and you can keep track of it. And you can also try to improve things like, for example, let's say that I comment this out, this should fail. So if I run it again, I should get a problem because I commented something wrong and I tried to run this. So if I go to ML flow, I see here, oh, I get the fail run here. So you can also keep track of things that didn't work out by doing this. And which commit was that? So you don't have parameters, you don't have metrics. You can add metrics, you can remove metrics, you can do stuff, but since this is all Python package, we can fetch some information and do some amazing stuff. So these are the pull requests that I'm working on this project. That is, for example, if the git is uh, dirty, so someone changed the script and run again without committing something to the Git repository, he won't be able to run that model. He first <coughs> needs to commit that. I don't want you working several times on the same commit. If you run again with the same commit, with the same parameters, I don't want you to run that because it's a waste of resources. So there are several, several things that we can add this and give to the data science and to, 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 and to the machine learning engineers to make sure that these things work out and they, that they can do better. And by that, I don't mean let's teach data science and machine learning all the software engineering and they are software engineers. No, we just need to provide the correct platform and the correct things for them that they can do a better job and then we can keep track of it. So with this, Small thing, I want to say first, check JD Hancock's, that's amazing pictures. And I wanna say thanks, but before I go, and the questions, I want to say one thing for everyone here, is that if you look around, you majorly see white males on this room, and I know this is part of everyone's life, but I, so, I, I see very many microaggressions at my daily life, against underrepresented groups, and I would like to ask everyone to step up when they see these kind of things. And if it's not, if it's woman, if it's gay, if it's Muslim, if it's a refugee or something, just like step up and stop with the, 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 the jokes and the making fun of things because we need to create safer environment, not just for white males. So this is just what I want to ask everyone before we go to the questions. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Do we have questions for Tiago? Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was saving for you. So. Okay. Do we have questions? Over there. Can I troll? Can I troll? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Which one? <laughs> yes. Hello. Uh, I have exactly the same problem between uh, our, uh, I'm not OPS side, but that is data science and OPS. And uh, we have this problem that everyone in data science wants to use different tools, 
PIP, Conda, Win Python, Science Python, and I'm, it's just only Python. <laughs> so the, pr the question is, how do you balance? Uh, so exactly, of course, we want to give a platform so that it's deployment ready on the day one. But where is the balance between giving freedom to these people? Because I know they're scientists, so they know their tools. They know which, which one is better. But I want it to be deployable. So yeah. how do you balance that? So for example, this thing for MLflow, it's very similar to other things that I built with. And I usually build with front end and full stack teams. But when you are, me when you are running a, a model, you always have metrics and uh, parameters. And when you run this, you need to save this someplace. And this, you can impose independent if it's PyTorch, if it's uh, another Python package, if it's on Scala, if it's on Spark, they always need to measure to see if their things are going well. So they need to save this to an object storage or a place. And this server thing that I showed you, it works, it's a React application. You can point that to anything. So if it's running on Python or Scala or something, you can still gather these things and put them together. So when I say that this is a Python thing and this is good because it's natively, it's because, yeah, the majority of the data science work in Python, but I don't want to restrict them for doing that. So, but you always have to keep in mind that they need to measure and put their metrics in a place that you can keep track of it, instead of saving in their desktop on their local things on their project. Yeah, it's, so it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard and that's the culture part. I can talk about tools and automation things and as much as possible, but the hardest thing is convincing them that they need to share this thing. But this usually is something that you can start bottom up, but yeah. It's hard. Someone from the top also needs to impose as like, you cannot do this, and you can do this by providing some uh, platforms that they can run in their containers, and automatically, all the metrics need to be saved into an object storage or things like this. There are platforms, for example, there is an open source platform called Zoe, that you can create Jupyter notebooks, Spark notebooks, and things like this that run on a container, and you can define that platform that can save the metrics that it runs in a, in a, in a specific uh, place. But the culture part is the hardest one, by far. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? Well, cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>